speaker of track B at the conference. So Victor studied computer science in Serbia, then got his PhD at MIT, and then he moved to EPFL Lausanne, where he's heading the group on automated reasoning and analysis. And Victor is one of the leaders of a, a new generation of researchers who is working at the intersection of theoretical computer science and formal verification, and in particular is developing and applying new techniques on satisfiability modular theories to the problem of introducing automation in the development and in the synthesis and in the verification of uh, software. So uh, please uh, welcome Victor, and we are all waiting for the talk. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for coming and thank you for this great opportunity to present uh, at ECALP. Uh, this talk is about the P of ICALP, uh, namely programming or, and the proofs about programs uh, and uh, more recently the motivation is for productivity of programmers that write these programs. Although I should say I, I have nothing against the other letters. Uh, uh, so the, the agenda here uh, uh, could be summarized with the slogan, your wish is my command. So we have on, on one hand, uh, we have some wishes that the, the developers would uh, uh, characterize uh, uh, the, their D uh, desired goals or perhaps end users and then we can formalize these wishes and arrive at formal specifications here uh, I will talk about formal specifications as constraints between inputs and outputs and often denote them by C and then from these specifications we can in one way or another derive a program uh, or uh, implementation P and uh, this talk uh, and, and this agenda is really about the connection between these formal specifications and program because that's something that we can uh, uh, specify very precisely. And so we, we are, will be interested in, for example, how to automatically verify that an implementation meets a specification, or even how to automatically transform a specification into implementation. And recursive functions come into play as, as a very uh, a natural language for describing these problems. And then, of course, in order to, to get programs to, to run, we need to compile them into some representation that's understood by modern uh, computer architectures, and that's also an interesting problem, but uh, one that I'm going to worry less about. So I, I'll be uh, looking at programs written in some functional uh, programming language uh, as the implementation P. So let's uh, look at an example of some wishes. Uh, a very simple example is sorting, which you could describe in natural language uh, as follows. Given a list of numbers, make this list sorted. Okay, so what would be the uh, slightly more precise formal specification? Uh, so, so this is just uh, describing what, what this is, right? So uh, given that list of numbers, we would still like to have that list. So in some sense, it should be permutation of the input. The, s the set or multiset of elements should be the same. And then we would like output to be sorted. So the, not like here, but like here. Right? Uh, so to, to express these, essentially there are two properties there. Uh, the, the fact that it's the same list and that it's sorted. And uh, it's natural to, to write another program that, that will uh, check this property. So take an input list, so this one here, and an output list, this one here, and then uh, compare that the, the set of elements is the same and that the output list is sorted. So I'm, I'm going from this natural language specification partly to emphasize that one of the main uh, benefits of specifications is that they're closer to the way we think about the problems or that we may want to think about the problems. And that's because they have this flexibility to express uh, properties as, for example, conjunction of two independent properties. Okay, so specifications can be written, of course, in, in different logics. For us, they will be actually executable at the same time. And that means that uh, we will not have uh, quantifiers, but we will have uh, recursion. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so that, that's the, the kind of uh, formulas that we'll be looking at. And now, in more generally, constraint will be uh, something that takes input and output, and, and it's a predicate, so it returns Boolean. And uh, implementation is a uh, function from the inputs to outputs. So here's in the, in the case of, of sorting, uh, we have seen the specification and the implementation would be some sorting algorithm. You can uh, choose, for example, insertion sort, quick sort, or whatever you would like. And uh, the correctness relationship, uh, when, when you view this as a function and relation is just a subset relationship. So we, we are looking only at safety here. Um, let's look at another example. This is a time conversion. So given a total number of uh, seconds, convert it into hours, minutes, and leftover seconds. Perhaps it's the length of a, a football game or a length of this talk. So specification would be something that takes this uh, total number of seconds 
and uh, takes also the, the hours, minutes, and leftover seconds and checks that the, the, con the, the relationship holds, right? So the relationship between this one and th that one. And uh, so this is a partial specification of this relationship. You would like this, of course, natural constraint to hold. If you look at the implementation, you can see that it does look a little bit more complicated. It, uh, it does the, the expected division and modular computations to compute hours, minutes, and leftover seconds. And we'll revisit this example later on. Now, uh, you, you may be wondering what, what kind of language I'm using here. So this def de defines a function C with these arguments and this result. This P also defines another function. So I'm using uh, a concrete syntax of the Scala programming language, which was designed at uh, EPFL by Martin Odersky. And it's a modern functional language that fuses a functional and object-oriented uh, style and has also expressive type system and lightweight syntax. For us, it's important that it su supports a, a purely functional fragment as well, and because that's what our tools uh, are built to handle. Uh, and it's actually gaining, p the language is gaining popularity in industry and academia because it interoperates smoothly with Java and has many other uh, good properties. And so a witness to that is the number of companies that use it, but also that, that if you look at uh, Coursera uh, website that offers online courses, this course on Scala given by Martin Odersky was taken by tens of thousands of uh, of attendees and many of them completed it successfully. So it's, it's a justified choice just like a, an ML or a Haskell would be, or perhaps even more uh, relevant today. Now which uh, kinds of uh, tasks are we interested in specifically? Uh, I was referring to relationships between implementation and uh, specification. So we could classify some of the tasks of interest uh, along two axes. One axis is whether we have both the constraint, the specification, and the program implementation, and then we, we are checking some correspondence, or we only have specification, which is what we'll see in, in the later part of the talk. So uh, that's one axis of classification. Another uh, classification criterion is whether we are doing primarily a runtime uh, check, or we are trying to do some compile time preprocessing. So according to this, we have uh, runtime checking of assertions, which is something that most languages support through assert constructs. And that means that once you have your inputs uh, and you, you execute program on these inputs, you can check whether the property holds. So that's conceptually easy bec because we have chosen these uh, constraints to be executable. Then verification is, of course, a harder problem because we have these universal quantifiers. So we would like to prove that for all possible inputs, the uh, program will satisfy its specification. Uh, and, and that's uh, a very w well studied and, and very interesting area. I will explain how it fits into uh, uh, our framework here and what we can do currently. Now, if you don't have program, you only have specification, then what can you do? Well, uh, if you say that constraints are useful description of the what, what program should be doing, perhaps they actually capture everything that you care about, then you, you can do constraint programming. So you can use constraint itself as the program, so you can execute constraints. That means that once you have the inputs to the program, you're looking for the outputs that satisfy the input-output relationship. And that's what I'll refer to as constraint programming. And then finally, synthesis is the static compile time counterpart to, to constraint programming, where instead of doing this process of searching for the output that satisfy the constraint every time you, you have an input, you uh, try to uniformly find a program P uh, that will satisfy this, the constraint, and then you will be only executing P, so you have uh, more predictability and p possibly more performance. So that's the synthesis problem uh, that, that I will spend uh, perhaps a much of this talk on. So let's just uh, go a bit more concretely into each of these uh, uh, tasks. Uh, runtime assertion checking, uh, in, in the case of this uh, sorting example, would be uh, expressed as follows. So in, in uh, in Scala, you, there exists a, a construct to check the post condition, uh, so that is to compare the, uh, to, to express the property of the result of the function. The result is expressed uh, as a bound variable before this arrow, so please don't confuse this with the implication. It's a bit unfortunate notation if you are used to this meaning implication, but it just denotes uh, anonymous function or binding of the value O, and this value O is bound to the result of the procedure. And so this Specification says that content of input should be equal to content of output, and the output is sorted, as we have seen before. Now, what is content and what is, is sorted? Well, we can just uh, write these as the usual recursive functions in Scala. So content takes a list and computes the set of elements in this list. If the list is empty, then the output is empty set. Otherwise, I take the union of the singleton element X 
and the content of the tail. So that's uh, as you would expect. And sorting is similarly uh, tra traversing the list recursively and checking that two successive elements are in the ordering relation. Here it's strictly sorted, so we cannot have duplicates actually. Okay, so the good thing about this is that this already works in Scala. Programmers are used to this, and uh, that's one reason why we chose uh, these specifications to be programs themselves. Uh, but it also has uh, benefits when, when you look for counterexamples. You can validate these counterexamples simply by executing them. And of course, it, if you just do testing, the, this works without any, anything special. Now, it does work without anything special, but it can be a little bit slow because these you're running all this extra code that you don't strictly need for, for function, functioning the program. So you are only, it's only there for checking. So you can at least optimize these runtime checks, and this is something that we have done using memoization. Uh, but, but also, uh, of course, you would like to eliminate these checks and just prove them statically once and for all. And so that's why we want to do more than just runtime checking. So we would like to get, gain predictability, prove that post condition will always hold, and, uh, and, and we would like to, to generate counterexamples when this is not the case. So, so we have the test inputs uh, that show that something went wrong. And so this is what, what we use static verification for. So that's this uh, problem where we ha now don't fix the input. We don't expect uh, to provide the test input but we want to prove that the constraint will always be satisfied. And the good thing uh, is that you, you write things in the same way. So you do, don't change the way you describe your problem. It's just like with runtime checking. It's only the guarantees and the functionality of the tool that are now better. So you, you type this program in, uh, in, in Scala and, and you can uh, see it being verified on the fly. So either uh, the, the system will produce a proof that for all i this constraint holds or uh, it'll find an input uh, uh, that shows that this does not hold. So I, I do have a, a, de a demo of the, uh, the system, uh, but it's at the website uh, EPFL, uh, Leon EPFL CH, and uh, you, you can check it uh, yourself later. So the verification could, in general, time out. We give it a relatively small time out and expect that uh, things, will, uh, things will fail or succeed quickly. So this is how, how uh, the, the screenshot of the system looks like. So th this is our sorting program. And uh, if everything goes well, then, then you get uh, check marks, everything is verified. And if, uh, if you have a bug, then it gives you a concrete counterexample uh, that says, for example, for this input list, if I, modif I modified here this uh, insertion into a sorted list, uh, it's actually pushing this inserted element all the way to the end, and the system comes up with a, an example list that uh, gives this counterexample. Okay, so you can try the, li uh, the that, uh, and that allows you to identify uh, the the problem in, in the system. So the, the system is called Leon, as I mentioned, and we have uh, used it primarily to verify uh, functional data structures, and there it seems to work very well. What, what I liked in comparison to some other systems is that you also get concrete counterexamples, and uh, that happens most of the time. If you write specifications or, or implementations, often they don't, uh, don't match, and that's sort of the common case. But of course, you want in the end to, to get the proof. So here are some examples. We have red, black trees. We have some transformations on propositional logic formulas, uh, some sorting algorithms, uh, uh, queues, uh, and uh, some syntax tree manipulations. And so this is work of um, my PhD students. Philip Suter is already graduated. He's a permanent researcher in IBM Research, and he started this work. So just uh, briefly how, how this works inside. Uh, so we, we try to make our life simpler. That's why we are working with a functional uh, language and with recursive functions without side effects. Uh, and, and then we try to gain automation and do, uh, do more uh, in other respects. So if you look at the, the size function, suppose that we just want to prove that size is non-negative, well then you would have verification conditions corresponding to trying to do this proof inductively. For the nil case, you just need to prove that zero return here is greater than or equal to zero, and for the other case, if you assume that the, uh, that the result is greater than or equal to zero, then you need to prove that uh, the, the newly computed value is, is still greater than or equal to zero. Now, this is a very simple example. So what, what do we do in, in general? You can see that on top of this uh, recursion scheme, th that's essentially induction on the execution uh, uh, tree, that we, we also need to perform some uh, arithmetic reasoning or more generally some algebraic reasoning. And so this is uh, uh, done using SMT solver, uh, so satisfiability modular theory solvers, which incorporate set solvers, but also decision procedures for various theories, and an interesting agenda is to enrich this set of theories that the, the solvers uh, support and to make, make them efficient. So um, in addition to this uh, linear integer arithmetic, which is uh, very useful, 
and it's often done using a simplex and, and uh, some uh, integer linear programming techniques. Uh, we, we have some uh, support for, for sets, for algebraic data types, uh, for in general for uh, term algebras, and uh, so for some uh, uh, arrays and so on. So uh, currently the solver we use is uh, Z3, and increasingly we are starting to use a CVC4. So these are uh, two solvers for very expressive uh, theories to be support. So after we do, do some processing of recursion, then we get to these formulas that uh, have uh, only some known, so to say, operations that for which we have the, uh, decision procedures. Now, that happens in, in a simple example like, uh, like size. What happens in an example uh, like this where we insert an element into a list? So in order to specify this, you may want to state property like this. So the contents of the result is content of the original argument union this singleton element. Here I just use math a variant of the notation. Now, you, you can still do the same, right? So base case is easy to check, uh, but the, the interesting case is the recursive one. And here you call a procedure recursively, and perhaps you can just assume that the, uh, the property holds for the recursive call, and then you want to prove it for the overall result. And then you get a verification condition like this. So, so th this one says that the res1, this is the result returned here, and then you would like to establish uh, that, uh, that this content of cons is equal to content of L union E under this assumption. And uh, so now what happened is that I used assume guarantee reasoning and I have eliminated this call to insert, right? So insert does not figure in my verification condition anymore. But, but the call to content remains because I have used content, a recursive function, in order to describe my properties. And that's the freedom that we have. So we can actually enrich our specification language with other recursive functions and, and then uh, describe properties of some functions using other functions. And that's very natural and very expressive. But how do we then prove uh, these verification conditions? Because SMT solvers were not designed in order to handle recursive functions. And that's in general a rather difficult problem. Uh, so we, we decided to look at, uh, inspired actually by this example of computing set of elements stored in some, some tree, uh, we look at uh, extension of term algebras with a recursive, with a recursive function. And we were wondering for whether it's decidable for this case, for this content function. Uh, and we proved that actually it is quantifier free formulas in term algebra extended with this and the, some quantifier free operations on sets and this function. Uh, it, this is decidable. And then from the proof, it turned out that actually the result holds much more generally. Uh, so we, we are looking at uh, these functions that are homomorphisms from the structure of algebraic data types that you have in this case lists, uh, into some, uh, some element domain C. This is a uh, domain of, for example, sets, where you have decided Boolean algebra, or integers, or actually there, there are not too many restrictions on what it should satisfy. And so how the restrictions are on the form of this function. Uh, so this function should really just do case analysis on the, uh, on the nullary or nary constructors of the of the algebraic data type, or in this case leaf uh, or node. If, if this is a tree, then it would be leaf or node. I sort of mix thing, things here a little bit. Otherwise, it would be nil and cons. So imagine this is a, a binary tree, then it would be leaf and node. And uh, in any case, you, you apply some, some expression in decidable logic to define the result in the empty case, and some exp uh, expression to, to decide how you combine the recursive calls on left and right subtree. So what is important, that recursion pattern is fixed. So you just uh, uh, call this function in, in this way. If you think about the sort of generalization of a bottom-up uh, deterministic tree automaton, uh, it, it would also have this form. And so uh, then, for what functions alpha uh, of this form is, is it decidable? So uh, you could try to decide it in the following way. Suppose that you, you have some binary tree then with constructor node, and you have constraints uh, of this form. So you have one tree which is constructed from two other trees, T2, T3, and with some elements stored inside E1. And you have uh, another tree like this. And then you have some constraints on sets. So this is your, your formula, and you're checking whether uh, it's satisfiable, whether there exists a solution for it. And th this is how the verification condition that I showed you looked like. So it has uh, these, uh, these formulas, and then it also has the application of the content function. And for uniformity, you can just assume that you apply, you compute the corresponding content for every tree that, that occurs in your formula. You just add the missing var variables if they're not there. So, okay, so that mapping is also there. So th this is sort of conceptually three parts of, of our formulas. 
And then how, wh what would be a natural way to check satisfiability? Well, th we have this recursive function content, we have its definition, and we see that T1 is equal to application of a constructor. So we can actually derive a consequence of the function definition that says that therefore C1 is equal to, to C2 union this E1 union C3. So this consequence is just applied, uh, uh, just derived by applying the definition of the fu recursive function content in a bounded way. And we do that to, uh, to some depth. I, I, if you don't know, these are variables, T1, T2, and T3, existentially quantified variables, then you could uh, do this forever, but you sort of do it only to the syntac syntactic depth that you get by unifying, by applying unification to the, this term algebra uh, part. And in this way, you get the, uh, these additional uh, constraints, and then you put them together with the original constraints you have in the formula, and you reduce your problem to, to the theory of this uh, structure C, to in this case, the theory of sets, which you can decide using many different uh, encodings. For example, uh, in, in Z3, we currently use encoding using uh, array combinators, uh, which is a ni nice decidable uh, fragment. You, you could use uh, other things, and this actually has finite model property if, if that those are the only operations that are shown here. And so th this we can solve. And th this is a, a sound uh, method, but unfortunately it's not, uh, not always complete. So th if you examine the problem of reconstructing models coming up back to some trees from these sets, then you discover that the, there, there are some uh, cases where, where this doesn't work. So here's an illustration of such case. So I say C1 is content of T1, C2 is content of T2, and then T1 and T2 are two distinct trees uh, such that the, the sets, the contents of these trees are empty. So if I apply uh, this process that I described before, I will get the satisfying assignment for the, uh, for the generated uh, set constraints. This would be just that both sets are empty. But actually, if T1 and T2 are two trees that both have empty content, then they have to be nil, so they cannot be distinct. So the original uh, constraints were not satisfiable. Okay, so because of that, we in, in addition to, we cannot consider just arbitrary uh, fun recursive functions alpha of this form, but we need to impose some further requirements. So one requirement is that uh, the inverse function of, of, of uh, uh, alpha with, with respect to every possible set is uh, non-empty, so the function is surjective. And the other one is that it's actually large enough. So surjectivity comes uh, so that we can find at least one tree, and this large enough uh, for the inverse image is so that we can satisfy these disequality on trees, disequalities on trees. Okay, and so uh, th this actually holds for our function content because uh, we so we need to add some more constraints to express uh, this uh, these technical conditions. But as long as the function satisfies uh, th this property that I just uh, informally mentioned, then th this works. So. Uh, for, for empty set, we have only one tree, and that's going to be sort of an exception. We treat that separately. But for all the other sets, there are infinitely many trees with duplicates that satisfy it. And for many other things, uh, the, the condition can also be ma made to work. So uh, what we, the, the notion of large enough is made a bit more precise here in this notion that we call uh, sufficient uh, surjectivity. So it's a, a bit funny term that we co coined. But uh, basically, it says that if you look at the, the shape, the skeleton of the, uh, of the algebraic data type value of the term algebra, then uh, you classify all, all possible skeletons into some finite set of exception shapes, which you treat specially and you for, uh, for which you check whether uh, the, the given terms uh, are of that form, and then uh, some other ones. And for these other ones, the inverse image uh, under uh, for, for every possible uh, value c should be uh, greater than p. And this, uh, this p uh, is sort of, th there's quantification for every positive p. So that means that you can make this arbitrarily large if you, uh, yeah, if you are outside of the uh, of this set of exceptions. So uh, I intuitively th th that happens often because when you look at larger sets, uh, then there are more and more trees that map to these sets or you can look at multisets and similar condition would hold. Okay, so when you have such, uh, 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 such function alpha, then you add it into term algebras and uh, into your term algebra, and you get a still decidable uh, quantifier-free constraints. And so that, that is interesting because there are many such functions. Uh, 
It's also interesting because we can have a uniform algorithm that does not need to be specialized for every individual function alpha. And this uh, algorithm actually combines the ideas of bounded model checking uh, and k-induction in, in a single loop uh, that uh, is guaranteed to find all counterexamples because it's going to unfold this recursion gradually. So in the limit, it's going to find the counterexamples. Uh, but what, what this, uh, uh, I I at the same time, it's assuming the post conditions, uh, and uh, th therefore it acts as k induction. W but uh, what is uh, what makes it uh, find counterexamples is that we we do two checks. So th this is the formula that I'm considering. Then at, at this step, I'm going to unroll it. So I'm going to replace it with a, a bigger one where I give more meaning to to my recursive functions. And then I'm checking the satisfiability and unsatisfiability to t for two formulas. So one is formula that blocks all recursive calls, and that's where I find all the counterexamples. And the other one uh, is just the formula that says, I don't care what the recursive function uh, returns uh, beyond certain depth. I just know that it's some value. And that gives a sound over approximation. So, so it's combining over and under approximation in this iterative uh, refinement of recursive calls. And so this simple algorithm turns out to be a decision procedure for many of these efficiently surjective functions. And that's actually what we implement. So in some sense, what we implement is very relatively uh, uh, simple, uh, but uh, to make it fast, uh, th there's uh, considerable engineering effort in involved. So we, we have some tight integration with the Z3 solver. And this was done by Philip Suter originally, now Etienne Knois, and many other students uh, later joined this project. And so it, it has, uh, <coughs> the procedure has some quite good properties. Uh, in practice, so theoretically, it, it's not so clear uh, that, that it would work so often, but it seems to work very often. Other people have al also implemented it and used in different contexts. So here's a, another citation, uh, what, uh, what a colleague uh, uh, of ours said. Let me just list some examples of operations that might convince you that this is an interesting uh, uh, result, despite its simplicity. So you have the, the content function is one e example, size, when you specify its post condition is another one, or height. Then you can also compute the maximum element or check some invariance. Uh, or uh, if you look at a tree automaton, this, this is something that we haven't uh, talked about originally, but you can classify the states of this automaton into different classes and then, uh, then actually still uh, get this uh, property to satisfy it. Okay, so I just want to say that this is not now a universal approach to verification. I still think it's a very good approach to implement as the baseline, but th there will be some cases when this, of course, fails. It's an undecidable problem. And the cases where it fails are the cases where you need to strengthen these in induction hypotheses. So it's, uh, the properties that you're stating are not k-inductive, uh, but, but are true. And there, you, all the machinery of, uh, of uh, program analysis comes into play. And I would just like to emphasize uh, some of the approaches. So for, for our concrete system, we, we have some approach to infer resource bounds, where we basically give templates uh, that say your uh, running time uh, of the program, parallel or sequential, is bounded uh, by, by, let's say, linear function of the tree depth without saying what this linear function is. And then the tool finds, finds actually concrete coefficients for this function and proves that this is the case. And this turns out to be non-trivial in the presence of all these recursive functions and algebraic data types. And uh, another line of uh, research has been actively pursued by, for example, Andrei Rybalchenko, uh, uh, recently Ken McMillan, Nikolai Bjornner, and many others, is to phrase these analysis problems using recursive horn clauses. And they're actually not that different not that far away from our uh, functional programs. It's just that our programs are deterministic. But uh, it turns out that a lot of the uh, results on uh, predicate abstraction, counterexample guided predicate abstraction, and interpolation that's used for predicate discovery can be formulated as approximating these recursive horn clauses by successively larger and larger uh, uh, acyclic uh, uh, horn clauses. So uh, th this, I think, is very promising re research direction. Now, uh, let, let me just reflect on some uh, other uh, line of research that I think is uh, it's still important uh, to complement uh, the, uh, these techniques. So, so I mentioned after we do unfolding, we invoke SMT solvers. And SMT solvers only handle whatever is built into them, whatever theories they support. So I mentioned it's relatively easy to handle sets. If you have multisets, things become more interesting, especially uh, interesting cases, uh, multisets with cardinality constraints. So you can just uh, count the sizes of, of the bags that the program manipulates. Uh, so, you, you, and this is a very expressive fragment that turns out to be related to Pressburger arithmetic. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, some natural or a naive approach to, to decide it, you quickly get to non-deterministic exponential time decision procedure. So we have shown that this is actually still within NP. 
uh, by using some results that I don't see often cited, but for example, if you look at uh, semi-linear uh, sets that characterize Pre Pressburger arithmetic formulas, uh, uh, you, you can prove that the coefficients there are, uh, have polynomial number of bits in the size of the formula. Uh, so, so that's one important thing. So, and uh, the other one is that uh, if you look at systems of integer linear arithmetic equ equations, uh, they have sparse solutions in the, uh, in the sense similar to what you would expect with, uh, uh, with the uh, deriving from ra ranks of matrices. So there's Carter Theodore theorem for, in the, for, in, uh, for cones in a, a convex, in a, is, for example, simplex and linear programming, that there's an integer analog for that that was uh, uh, proven by uh, uh, Fritz Eisenbrand and, uh, and, and Gennady Shmonin. So, so these techniques that I mentioned, they can be used to enrich uh, then the, uh, the pr decision procedures that uh, SMT solvers support. And I think this is two aspects that we need to deal with. So we want to have stronger and stronger algebraic reasoning and uh, at, at the same time, we, we, we need something to support more uh, general uh, recursion uh, and looping patterns. So, so this is an illustration of, uh, of what kind of techniques we've been using for verification. Now, let me uh, seemingly switch gears to something different and look at constraint programming, where we say, why would we, if we already have these specifications, why do we need to have a program to start with, right? Why can't we just uh, use the specifications themselves and execute them? So we build systems that, uh, that do that. So in this system, you wouldn't write a sorting procedure at all. You wouldn't have to write a sorting procedure. You would just write this definition of content and is sorted. And then if you want to sort a list, you can uh, just t take a, a list and say that you, you would uh, like this to be sorted and its content to be equal to a given one. So it's going to give you uh, the, the sorted version of the list. So you can find a sorted a list that, uh, whose content is a given one or for example, you, you can take a more complicated operations like red black tree, so it's a tricky data structure. You just define red black tree invariance following the description in the textbook, and then you say to insert into red black tree, you say find me a tree whose content is equal to the content of the original element plus the, the, new, uh, the new element. So this is just union, and this is singleton. And uh, so this is initially when you write it, if you know how to write red black tree, then you may say, why do I need this? But if you don't know how to write red black tree, that this is much uh, simpler. And moreover, uh, th this really follows if someone tries to explain you how red black tree works and why it works, uh, th the description here follows uh, those invariants. Right? So the often data structures are described in terms of their invariants and the operations are derived from them. And what I find particularly important is that uh, you use this conjunction. You conjoin invariants and then uh, some uh, description of the individual operation. And that gives you much more reuse than you have in operations. Now, if, if uh, you think about the now implementing uh, the delete operation for red black tree, so suppose that now we, we want to implement delete or remove. Now, th this is the implementation in C. So after you have written the lookup and written insert, you will need to write uh, uh, th this code in order to write remove. Whereas in, in, in this system, you just write the same thing, but instead of a plus, you, you write minus. And the system is generic with respect to these properties. So if you want different data structure, you define different invariants. So I it's uh, d definitely much easier to program. Uh, now, how, how do we actually make this work? So we reuse the verification techniques from before, and that's why I uh, it's partly related to, to the thing before. So our verifier is good at finding counterexamples. So now what we do is uh, we, we take the negation of this constraint. So we, we have the input, this becomes a constant. Then we take negation of the constraint applied to this input and we try to, to verify that, that there are no solutions. But then we, we get a counterexample if there is, is a solution and that's the solution for our constraint. So it's just a basic, uh, basic logic here. But the point is that this universal quantifier that we have in verification is, is we handle it by by also giving counterexamples, uh, so it's in a, in a constructive way. So we can use this these counterexamples here really for computation, and that's uh, uh, one thing that that I think is important. That these uh, techniques that were originally designed for verification, uh, they uh, are, have been gradually adding the ability to add counterexamples, and I think this should be treated as a first class. Uh, capability, so you should really say we, we are building constraint solvers and not just decision procedures. So he, here are some results. Uh, if you look at the lists, then uh, the, this runs for, for lists up to size 10. So you, you have here the, the, the running times. 
and for red black trees, uh, so it's slower. But this is enough for prototyping, right? So you can test out. There are lots of trees that, that uh, you can try out and see how, how the procedure works. Uh, lots of trees of size 10. Okay, so this is a, a, a very expressive fast prototyping uh, approach. And uh, it allows us to see uh, what, what it feels like to program with constraints. Now, to, to get this uh, really as efficient as, as the developers expect, we need to work on synthesis. So we, we want to uh, implement this functionality that allows us to program with constraints more efficiently by coming up with, with programs that have good behavior. And so this is the, the problem of synthesis. This is also essentially the topic of, uh, of our ERC uh, project that is called implicit programming. And uh, so I sometimes use this term. The, the reason for implicit programming is really this, uh, to characterize this distinction between the, uh, the constraints and the programs. So uh, constraints can be given as implicit functions of two arguments, right, inputs and outputs. And uh, we explicit version is one that gives outputs as a function of the input. So you can here see it in the case of circle. We, of course, also have some combinatorial objects. Uh, you, you can consider the following problem. Take a propositional formula. And then input is a uh, partial assignment, assignment was for some of the variables, and output should, uh, should be the completion of this assignment so that the formula is true. So that would be, uh, so if you are given inputs and outputs, then uh, checking that is trivial. You just evaluate propositional formula for this uh, assignment. On the other hand, uh, what would be a, a program that, uh, that uh, realizes this relation? So the program would map uh, the, the input into the output uh, such that the, the formula holds. And uh, you can actually synthesize such programs. Uh, you, for example, you can use binary decision diagrams to construct them, and then they will run efficiently, even though the process of constructing them uh, may, is expensive and uh, the programs may be exponential in size. But this is an il also illustration of the gain of synthesis, because if you do this at, at, com at runtime, then you are given an input, and now you're looking for satisfying uh, completion that would entail invoking a set solver, right? Whereas synthesis can actually pre-compute all these results as a kind of decision tree. Okay, so that's what we would like to do, go from these constraints into the, the programs. And uh, in some sense, you're solving equations here, you, but uh, equations are programs. If you have here an integer equation, three, uh, three times input plus uh, two times output is equal to 13, then you would like to say that output is equal to some function of inputs. And often you get some precondition. It's not always possible to realize this. And so th this is what we would like to compute as well. So that, uh, our goal is to come up with such equation solving for programs. Uh, it's interesting to consider that for some theories that we understand very well, like Pressburger arithmetic. Uh, and there, a great starting point is quantifier elimination. So if you apply quantifier elimination, then you can actually compute the most general precondition that's actually the result of quantifier elimination. But then this generated code is something that we think of uh, as a side product of quantifier elimination, but here it's the main thing. Then those are the, the witness terms that, that witness uh, the, the fact that these uh, uh, values for variables exist in, in quantifier elimination. Okay, so and here's the situation for many of these uh, decidable theories is very good. So we can detect if there are multiple solutions for a given constraint. We can find the, the, the motional precondition and so on. And now we would like to lift this to, to other theories as well. So not just for integer arithmetic. But integer arithmetic also has some uses. Now let me go back to the time conversion example. So this is how a more complete specification would look like. So in addition to this constraint that I gave before, you would like to say that hours, minutes, and seconds are non-negative, and then minutes and seconds are bounded. So if you give this input, uh, the, this uh, procedure uh, can automatically synthesize the corresponding program that computes hours, minutes, and leftover seconds. And so we have gar guaranteed uh, termination of, of the procedure. Uh, we know that it always succeeds. It always computes the most general uh, precondition. You, m you may think this is perhaps a contrived example. Well, let me show you one example uh, that, uh, that came up. This is an actual code from uh, uh, the boot sequence of a, uh, a player. Uh, it it's, was actually a, yeah, so a relatively uh, popular uh, uh, player, uh, like an MP3. And it had this, um, the, the, this kind of code in the boot sequence. It was computing uh, whether it's, uh, it was trying to compute the, the date given the number of days since 1980. Right? And there's this computation that has a leap year specification. And it was checking whether the number of leftover days is less than 366. And if it isn't, then it was decreasing and so on. So what happened is that on December 31st, 2008, which was the 
the first end of leap year after the release of the software, all the, uh, the players uh, froze in the boot sequence because this was running in the boot sequence to determine the, the date. And so you, you can find this, this, this uh, snapshots of the, this code on the internet. So uh, and if, you, if you look uh, carefully in, the, in this loop, you will notice what happens in when you have the last day of leap year. Then the, the variable days becomes equal to 366, and actually no code is executed in that case. So it's just an infinite loop. <coughs> So uh, why, why am I mentioning this example? Because actually, this example does have a specification using uh, integer linear arithmetic. So it's a little exercise to use uh, modular and division in order to describe what a leap here is and what it means to do the, this conversion. And uh, then, then you can automatically uh, generate the code from the specification. And code uh, the code that is generated from these specifications always terminates. May not be the most efficient one uh, for, for our procedure, but it always terminates. Okay, so uh, the, the way this uh, procedure works is uh, it, it uh, has the rules for Pressburger arithmetic and then uh, it, the, they are invoked in somehow more general framework. And uh, this more general framework also supports synthesis of some recursive functions. Here is the specification of insertion into a sorted list. Again, it has this familiar uh, shape. And then sorting is expressed as saying that you want the result to be sorted and the content is equal to the original list, as we have seen. And from that, our system can automatically uh, generate the, in this case, insertion sort. Okay. Uh, and so there are uh, other examples as well uh, that uh, you, you can learn more about in the Uppsala paper. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about the, the framework that the system does. Uh, here's some somewhat arbitrary notation uh, that means the following. So this is the synthesis problem that we are trying to, uh, to solve. Uh, it has several components. One is the specification. That's the main part. The other things are sort of auxiliary. So this is just declaration of the inputs. So uh, one kind of uh, variable here is the, the input variable. The, the other is the description of the output. So these are the, the variables that we are trying to express in terms of inputs. And then there is this uh, uh, pi, which is just a path condition. So this is assumption uh, the, of the, that describes context, context under which we are doing this synthesis. For example, if you are within some conditionals inside the program. And the result is a solution that has the precondition and the program term that gives the value. And so th the uh, ideal expectations would be the, the following. Actually, uh, you, you construct this term t, and then, uh, first of all, what, what you would uh, li like is that uh, when, you, when you substitute, w when the precondition p holds, this is the condition, then uh, this result should be correct. So specification, when you plug in t instead of x, this output, then it's, it's something uh, expressed in terms of input that it's uh, always valid. This should be a, oops, this should be a valid formula. So that, that is rather clear. So p is just a con condition when we manage to generate the solution. This, this part is, of course, obvious. Th this is just a tautology, valid formula. If, uh, uh, but th this condition would be the completeness. So this says that uh, p is the, the most general uh, uh, condition. The, the weakest uh, condition. So if you, for, for some things like Pressburger arithmetic and, and some other ones, we have uh, these three implications and therefore equivalence. And, but this implication is uh, completeness, or it's not necessary for correctness. And for when we are synthesizing recursive functions, then in general this does not hold. Okay, so le let me illustrate how this works. Uh, some of the rules that we apply are fairly uh, generic. They would apply in any uh, context. Uh, so, for example, you, you can have a case please rule. Here's a specification that has the form of a disjunction. So what do you do? Well, you, you try to synthesize for each of the disjunct. Or th that's one of the things you could try. Suppose you succeed. You get a precondition one and, and a program one, precondition two and program two. So how do you then construct the, the program? Well, you can use if then else, and you have s several possibilities. The new precondition will be the disjunction, because whenever the disjunction holds, then you do have a result. And the result picks T1 or T2. Uh, if they're disjoint, then it's clear. But uh, in general, you could, for example, favor P1. So whenever precondition P1 holds, then you return T1. And so this is how the, the, this looks like as a kind of deductive rule. Right? So you, in order to do a synthesis for disjunction, uh, you do synthesis for individual disjuncts, and then you combine the results using if, if then else. So you can see how you can generate uh, lo uh, loop-free code fragments in this way. So what happens for linear integer arithmetic? Let me illustrate this uh, as well. Uh, so here's uh, a constraint the, in these uh, funny brackets. It uh, has the input A. So we don't know what A is. We would like to 
come up with a procedure that satisfies this constraint uh, wh when A will be taken as an input. And the constraint has some equations, has some inequations. So <coughs> we look at this equation and we ap apply uh, an extended Euclid's algorithm here to characterize the solutions of X and Y in terms of some parameter T. We can do that uh, in the space of uh, integers, for example. And then we, we say we will uh, find this T and then our solution will be in, in this form. Okay, so extended Euclid's algorithm gives you this. If, uh, uh, if you get some, these are mutually prime. If they are, for example, even, you would get a precondition on A that A needs to be even as well. Uh, so now, what do we do after, uh, in order to get the actual T? Well, we plug in T back into our inequalities, and then we apply something like fourier modskin uh, but for, for integers, right? So step in quantifier elimination for in integer arithmetic. For example, such steps uh, were d done in omega decision procedure. It was implemented some time ago. So here, uh, in this particular example, I have a upper bound and a, a lower bound on T. And so uh, I get a precondition. So, so A needs to satisfy this, this condition. And that's going to be my precondition. And what is the result? I can pick as a result, let's say, the, uh, the lower bound, if I prefer small solutions. And so that's then the result of this auxiliary step that I use as an assumption. And that's the value of my T. Uh, so T is going to be equal to this, and precondition I inherit from, from there. Because I needed to find T, therefore I needed to find uh, the uh, X and Y as well. And so this is an illustration of how these, these rules work. And uh, we, we have a number of rules, including these rules for, for integers, like the one that I've illustrated here. Uh, some rules for, uh, that are generic work for any, uh, any theory, just assume some basic uh, propositional operations or actually uh, perform search over the space of programs and try to uh, verify efficiently uh, potential candidates. And then we have also uh, some rules for algebraic data types for, for term algebras. And for other theories, you would add more rules. And so uh, this is, of course, d a difficult problem to do, do automatically. We have some, some initial results. Uh, I mentioned some sorting. Uh, th there's a, some also uh, synthesis of operations on, on some queues. Uh, uh, operations on lists. Uh, th this is uh, this address book benchmark manipulates multiple lists, and uh, so I mentioned there are different techniques that we are using. I, I will not talk much about these uh, search-based techniques, even though they are actually very important for synthesizing uh, recursive programs. So it's uh, a form of uh, counterexample guided inductive synthesis. If you want to, to get more guarantees, uh, you, you may uh, not be particularly happy about uh, the fact that we use uh, quantifier elimination as the baseline for handling uh, arithmetic constraints. After all, we know that automata uh, give much better uh, properties. And so we have looked at uh, automata procedures uh, for, uh, for these uh, integer uh, constraints. And of course, the good thing there is that you have more expressive power. Right? So you get uh, all the operations that are definable uh, in uh, monadic second order logic over uh, let's say, uh, st strings, if you look at uh, encoding of integers as uh, sequences of bits. So th there are finitely many uh, digits that you need to consider, and so weak monadic second order logic is uh, sufficient here. So we used actually Mona tool in, and built a prototype and showed that it, it y indeed uh, can handle a lot of expressive constraints, and uh, then it also allows for theoretical analysis. Because once you have uh, built a deterministic automaton that corresponds to constraints between inputs and outputs of your integers, then you can uh, actually generate a two-pass procedure that traverses this automaton once in a forward way, once in a backward way, and, turns out, uh, and, and th that gives you a characterization of all the programs that you synthesize from these relations. So this is slightly different than reactive synthesis that has been uh, s studied in the automata framework because we are allowed to look at the entire input sequence and it is finite. That's why we have this two-pass approach. And so we have looked, uh, well, monadic second order logic doesn't give you uh, any particularly nice bounds, but you can look at weaker logics that he, uh, still uh, define the same class of uh, these uh, definable relations, but less succinctly, and that's what we did in the subsequent work in Nichkar where we have looked at simply Pressburger arithmetic with bitwise operations, uh, so unbounded uh, bitwise operations. And th uh, that, that is a very nice language as well. So now, uh, this was about integers. If, if you think about the, the kinds of numbers that programs manipulate, uh, uh, real numbers also come into play. Of course, uh, programs don't tend to explicitly manipulate real numbers because there are too many of them. 
Uh, so th there are some uh, finite approximations on them, such as floating points or fixed points in embedded systems. So we also have some work that tries to bridge this gap between the mathematical models in terms of real numbers and, and these finite approximations. So here the idea is you write your mathematical function and then you say, I would like to get result, the end result, and it, it should be uh, with this many significant digits. And th this is actually something that uh, is n uh, not currently uh, done in a sound way, so there's very li limited support for that. And so we have built, uh, Eva Darulova, PhD student in my group, has built several tools that support that. Uh, she also uses, to some extent, the, the Leon infrastructure, but uh, mostly I there are specific techniques to this problem that estimate the, the error uh, uh, during ground off in a sound way. And we applied it to several benchmarks from embedded systems and physics simulations. So one, one th when you run simulation, you, you often don't really know uh, how much you should trust the result. I mean, this is often done empirically. So here we actually have the, the trusted results. Okay, so, so this sort of um, um, brings me towards uh, the wrap up of my talk. Uh, so I, I was uh, talking about several di different uh, kinds of problems uh, f f culminating with the synthesis, I even though actually each of these problems uh, is relevant for synthesis itself in some way. So if you look at uh, checking assertions, it turns out that uh, when we do uh, synthesis, often we want to check whether a candidate solution has any uh, promise to be uh, a correct solution. You can do that by, having a manip uh, by accumulating a set of test cases and running these programs. So this is again one reason why it's good to have executable programs and specifications. Uh, so faster dy dy dynamic checks uh, for checking properties help here. And also optimization of these checks is a form of uh, transformation-based synthesis. I, I have talked about synthesis that really bridges a large gap between these implicitly defined relations and, and functions. But of course, op high-level optimization you can also view as a form of synthesis. And we have done this with a colleague, Christoph Koch, at EPFL in the context of database operations. Now, if you look at verification, so th there is a uh, quite strong connection to synthesis. Uh, because if someone gives you a candidate program, that wh what you need to do is to, to verify it, to, to know that, that it's, uh, it's correct, that it, it is a solution. And if, you, if the verification fails, then you will get a counterexample. And this counterexample is good to keep around for, uh, because you can later quickly invalidate uh, subsequent uh, wrong solutions. Uh, and uh, also, strictly speaking, if, if you wanted to pr prove uh, more complicated properties, uh, so not just these safety properties, but also some existential properties, then synthesis may be a good way uh, to actually do the proof itself, b because from constructive uh, proof you, you would uh, get a program, and a program is a witness for the existential quantifier. So th uh, if you have more expressive logics, then these two uh, will uh, collapse into a, a theorem-proving problem of a certain kind. And then in uh, constraint programming uh, is also related to synthesis because in some sense uh, synthesis is, is a, a, a difficult to build compiler and constraint programming is an interpreter. An interpreter is something that we can build uh, more easily. We have less guarantees, you know, in interpreters sometimes crash with uh, t type errors if you have a dynamic language. Similarly here, interpreter may crash uh, due to constraint having no solution even though programmer thought that it should be, there should be a solution. So, so there are some disadvantages, but the, the big advantage is that we, we can have this technology now and it can uh, run uh, for small uh, values already. Okay, so, so what, what do we really build on in summary? We build on uh, decision procedures for integer arithmetic term algebras, arrays, sets, multisets, and so on, and, and there should be more of them. And this is uh, ongoing uh, work in the community. There's the SMT lib standard and, and many people are working on different decision procedures. They are called decision procedures, but that's for traditional reasons. Decision procedure should give yes or no answer, right? but, but we, we are really interested in its constraint solvers. We, we would like to get, when, there, when the answer is, uh, the constraints are satisfiable, we would like to get a satisfying assignment. Perhaps over reals, uh, you need to relax this. You, you need to get an interval for satisfying assignment or something similar. So, but putting all this together is non-trivial. In particular, we need to deal with combinatorial explosion here. Uh, th that's what we use uh, set solvers. And I mentioned for verification, there are important inductive generalization techniques. So we have used certainly inspiration uh, from, from automata techniques, and I think there's more to do here. Uh, reactive synthesis is a, a, an ongoing and active area of research. Here, it's, uh, the difficulty is different, for example, for our uh, use of automata for, to describe bits. We, we don't have liveness properties. Uh, we instead use the, these automata to describe arbitrary large uh, integers. And so that's, that's what makes this, compared to some finite state or, or pushdown systems, 
what makes these difficult is all these unbounded uh, variables that can range over trees, over integers, and so on. And I mentioned some connections between three automata and uh, these uh, sufficiently surjective uh, functions alpha that I was talking about. And so uh, w uh, I think synthesis is a very interesting uh, goal because it's a more uh, active way uh, to use all this technology. I it's a way to use this technology uh, to help developers while they're uh, writing programs as opposed to uh, uh, help with some exercises of verifying programs after the fact, which most people are unwilling to do if they're interested in just uh, shipping their, their software. So I think uh, uh, in terms of impact, uh, we may have more impact uh, by, by looking at synthesis uh, approaches. And so, so that's, that's the part of the space that, uh, that I, I, we are currently working on and that I, I meant to talk about. We are also looking a little bit at this uh, fuzzier uh, a region between the wishes and specifications, looking at some statistical techniques, how to uh, come up with likely descriptions, likely programs or specifications that users would like to satisfy. But I had no time to talk about it in this talk, and it's a, a, a more recent uh, direction of research uh, for me. Uh, so uh, on this note, I would just like to finish. Th th thanks to everyone for your attention, and I'll happy to be happy to take questions. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so I would expect that a real sort function takes a comparison functor or comparison function as an argument. And then specification should look like uh, if uh, this comparison function implements a total order, then the sorting function really sorts. So the question is whether you can uh, formulate the specifications and if you can, can you actually verify them in real life? Thank you. Okay. Uh, th this is a very good question. Uh, th those are the, the kinds of uh, more reusable specifications that you find in, in current uh, object-oriented libraries. And indeed, we would like to verify them. Uh, we, we had some version of, uh, of uh, a Leonard verification system uh, that, uh, that implements higher-order functions, which is what you would like to, to have in this case. Uh, uh, and uh, so, but it's still ongoing work. Um, I would say one difference uh, w would certainly appear in the decision procedures because you would then like to look at uh, uh, the decision procedures not necessarily for linear uh, integer arithmetic but for more uh, formulated more abstractly in terms of axioms but this particular one for uh, for quantifier free total orders uh, actually is uh, is decidable and uh, you you could uh, probably the universal axiomatization within the current smt solvers would not do such a bad job uh, so there's some a quantifier instantiation uh, heuristics that uh, that for uh, problems like uh, l like these uh, these, ac these axioms uh, should uh, should work because you don't need to do so many instantiations, so you should get a local local theory in that case. But yeah, it's a, it, it's a good point that this is how you would like to write your libraries to be more reusable. Okay, further questions? There is one here. You said you verified red black trees. Uh, did yes. You deal with uh, okay. the balancing. Uh, yes. So actually, we did verify balancing, but uh, uh, that that was not actually the most difficult part. Uh, the the it just so so turned out that it works. Th there's one property that we did not uh, uh, verify automatically, even though, uh, I mean, the, the, it's it's uh, certainly possible. We just just our system uh, doesn't do this kind of reasoning yet, which is actually a sortedness. So we actually have the. Uh, uh, the sortedness for lists and so on, but b because you want to use bounded quantifiers uh, to express sortedness, uh, we didn't do it. Another way to express sortedness is a decision procedure for uh, for uh, l uh, sets with min and max, uh, w which uh, we've also described, but uh, it's not deployed yet. So, but balancing I is uh, is verified. Yeah. So, what was the specification there? Uh, so, uh, well, uh, the red black tree has the red black property. We have formalized the. Uh, the, the red black property, and we, we have the specification for height, uh, and uh, and so uh, the, we we have also the, uh, the the count the black height as well, and so we say that black. So that that's considered uh, to be more more difficult, but turn out that this uh, k induction and the uh, the post conditions that we write were were not uh, uh, not so difficult for the system to prove here. Yeah.
So you've been talking about synthesizing programs. Yes. Can you say anything about how efficient these programs are, mm -hmm. or what happens <coughs> if there are no very efficient solutions? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so synthesis can uh, can time out. I, even I, I, if we look at some uh, uh, what we call synthesis procedures, where you have a decidable logic and uh, something that has, for example, quantifier elimination, uh, uh, then uh, you, you you can sort of look at the worst case. W where does the worst case uh, happen? Uh, say for uh, for the kind of procedure for Pressburger arithmetic that we have. Uh, it, it happens when you have uh, divisibility constraints uh, with, with large co coefficients. Then uh, the quantifier elimination step would produce large disjunctions. This would uh, uh, result in in large uh, uh, number of branches or, or, or a loop that tries many, lo loop with constant bounds, but that tries many different possibilities. Uh, so so in those cases, you, you could generate uh, inefficient code. And that's why I said for, if you want more guarantees, uh, we obtain better guarantees with uh, automata-based procedure than, than, than with these. Uh, so for, for the more open-ended uh, uh, domains, like a synthesis of uh, functions that uh, manipulate uh, trees and produce other trees and so on, uh, there, there we, we have uh, fewer guarantees. So basically the, the procedure at some point will generate uh, many uh, alternative uh, ways to, to proceed, so it will expand the tree in somewhat uh, uh, breadth first way, and if it doesn't find solution up to certain depth, it, it just gets overwhelmed by the by the size of the frontier of this tree, and it will time out. So that, that that's how I, I, it can fail to find the solution in first place. It can find inefficient solutions, yes, or it can find solutions that meet the spec, but turns out the, this specification was not strong enough. And uh, so there, I would say the. Uh, so we, we are working. We, we have this work to estimate the uh, the, the cost of, of synthesized programs, so the, their uh, runtime complexity. Uh, but uh, currently, uh, you basically are looking for small programs, and uh, the hope is that uh, that uh, uh, very stupid programs are, are not not the smallest ones. Because if you expect something sophisticated, you you need to help the system a little bit by perhaps supplying auxiliary functions with some specifications so that the system will uh, be more likely to find it. So currently it's, it's more heuristic how we hope to, to get the, uh, the more efficient programs. Uh, I should mention that actually system also supports interactive application of these, uh, these procedures. So that, that's a process where you uh, refine your specification. For example, you could do case analysis uh, or you, you could uh, apply the induction schema and say, I want to implement this specification using recursion and then it will refine your specification into the, what, something that you need to satisfy in the base case and something that you need to satisfy in the recursive case. So you, you can uh, uh, do it interactively and that's probably uh, for, for anything larger that this is how we will need to use it. So maybe a last question, if uh, necessary, urgent. <laughs> Not the case, okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.